Shift uh, partner ecosystem team. Hi, I'm Ankur Shadda. I'm a senior solution developer uh, at JFrog. Uh, my role is pretty much uh, to do partner integrations, play with the product. And uh, before JFrog, I was a build and release manager at Oracle. I uh, architected a, a, a build system of a Fusion middleware product. Um, had about like 2,500 palms, uh, was quite complex. Uh, and also I used to manage the compliance uh, process uh, for a middleware product at Oracle. So let's get started. Okay, so um, what are we gonna talk about today? The title's kind of long and blown out. Um, so I have a bit of agenda on here. I'm gonna very briefly talk about what DevOps is. And, and based on the audience and the talks this morning, I have a feeling everyone has a pretty good idea. So we're just gonna get a couple of basic concepts out. Um, we're gonna talk about containers. And that I'm expecting a few less people have some experience with. And we're gonna talk about how the OpenShift product enables containerized development and deployment. Um, then I'm gonna transition over and we're gonna talk about where Artifactory factors into that and how we can use that for the build process and our images. And then we're gonna do a demo that thankfully I'm not doing so I don't have any of the live pressure demo that normally comes along with these kind of talks. So what is DevOps? Um, you ask anyone in here and you're probably gonna get some slightly different answers. Um, a couple of things I wanna focus on on this slide. The idea of automation, the idea of the rapid feedback and the rapid builds and deliveries. All of the stuff that was covered today during the Google Keynote, um, these, are, these are integral concepts to DevOps. So what happens though? Um, deploying containers, I'm sorry, deploying applications is difficult. Um, it's never really been made as easy as we want. It's just getting more and more complicated as the technologies progress. Um, there's a lot of dependencies that go on. There's build processes. Um, and all this leads to slow delivery of features and it leads to um, frequent downtimes when we're actually trying to upgrade and get the deployments out there. So I call this the solution. Um, really containers are one solution or one piece of the solution. But containers enable you to um, much more easily share and package your applications and transition them between development and production environments. And it gives you that run anywhere type of mentality that we've been striving for for quite a long time now. Um, gives you that consistent environment between developers, between developer and operations. Um, predictability, where we have the same pieces going throughout and we're not running into an issue of, oh, did this library change or is there some kind of production versus QA difference that we're gonna run into. Um, but what are containers? And there's really gonna be two main views on this depending on who you're talking to. Now, from an infrastructure standpoint or from your, your really um, kind of low level viewing, um, they're sandbox processes running on a Linux kernel. They're not quite as heavyweight as virtual machines, but conceptually they're somewhat similar. Um, whereas you have your packaged image, all of your dependencies, all of your runtime associated with it. But again, it's running at the Linux process level. It's not running in a full-blown virtualized environment like VMs are. Uh, as you can imagine, all of that packaging and, and, and that consistency together makes things significantly more portable across different environments. So that's from the infrastructure standpoint. Um, from the application standpoint, or from what our developers are looking at, um, it's a way of packaging not only my application, but all of its dependencies uh, in one actual unit. Um, it gives us this ability to um, deploy to any different environment and have that portability across the environments. So we maintain that consistency from one machine to the next and one environment to the next. So there's a view of what your typical DevOps flow would look like using containers. Um, we start on the left with our developer and our source code repository. There's no surprise there. Um, at this point, pretty standard practice of using a CI CD engine that's gonna go through and take our builds and run our automated tests. Um, at that point, you'll see where we're gonna pull in the libraries for the build process, and out comes a containerized image. That image gets stored in some kind of image repository. And we'll talk a bit about that a bit later on in the presentation. And then deployed anywhere. Physical hardware, virtual machines, hybrid cloud, um, public, private. Again, the portability of the containers, the fact that everything is packaged together and all of our dependencies are coupled along with our application. That portability is one of the biggest features that we get out of it. So how do we go from having this container image and actually getting it somewhere on some hardware? 
The problem is it's not quite that easy. Uh, we have a containerized app, but chances are our app is made up of multiple containers or multiple microservices. Um, those are going to have dependencies. So it's not going to be just take a single container and dump it out to one or more machines. There's this interplay of network connectivity. There's access to required other services. And then there's multiple services going on within our actual application. So we need more than just the container. It's not just, hey, throw your application in a container and you suddenly achieved all of your DevOps dreams. We need to manage where the containers get deployed, when they get deployed. Um, we need to keep an eye on their health, make sure they're still running. When we're looking at these high-scale um, applications that are deployed across dozens or hundreds of containers, we need to have a way of understanding how that's functioning, if it even is still functioning. Um, we need to be able to uh, manage the security on those. In DevOps, if we're looking at these rapid builds and deployments, we need to understand what's going into our containers and to make sure that any security vulnerabilities are included in the most recent builds. Um, and then we need persistence. Uh, it, it's a great idea to have these stateless applications that can scale indefinitely. But the reality of the situation is there is going to be data that needs to stick around. And how do we manage that? And how do we make sure that as containers come up and go down that the data maintains the same? So how does OpenShift enable our container story? We've seen that DevOps will benefit from a containerized solution. Well, how do we actually work with our containers? So we started with a project called Kubernetes. Uh, it is a container orchestration engine, uh, fully open sourced, and it handles the deployment, the scheduling, and the management of our containerized applications. So we take a look at that previous picture, all of these questions of where does the application get deployed, or how do they interact with each other, or how they discover other services running in the environment. Uh, Kubernetes fits into the picture in the middle there. That takes care of getting all of these containers out there for us. So like I said, it's open source. Um, and I mentioned this slide just to show the diversity in included. Um, Docker is the container image format. Um, at this point, it's largely the de facto image format. Um, but it's a standardized image format that Kubernetes has settled on, that Red Hat OpenShift has settled on. And then on the right side, we see the breakdown for Kubernetes. Again, it started as a Google project, has a very healthy upstream, um, many different contributors, both companies and individuals. So what is the overall flow look like here. Um, going for that picture we had earlier where we go from developer up to our container image, we get Kubernetes, it puts it out to the servers. It's not quite enough though. Um, we can't just dump a bunch of containers out on our servers. We need a little bit more than that. We need some networking configuration. How do we handle our external routes into our applications? We need an image registry. Docker Hub, which hosts um, Docker Image as a public repository, that's good in most cases, but chances are a lot of enterprises are going to need their own image registry for various reasons, be security or scale, or just due to wanting to hold on to their own data. Um, so we need some kind of image registry in play that's gonna take all of these images between when they're built and how they're actually deployed to the servers. We need a bit more than that. Earlier I mentioned how metrics and logging are becoming even more important as the scale of these applications grow. How do I know that I've scaled up my services correctly? And if I've broken things down to this microservice model where I can turn the knobs on each individual service, that's awesome, that's a great place to be. But we need to know how far we tweak those. And we need to understand if something is running suboptimally or just not running at all. So our metrics and logging, which has always been important, becomes even more important as the scale increases. Top of that, we have some more deployment concerns, in particular upgrades, which kind of a personal thing for me. For the past five or so years, I've been dealing with um, various upgrade questions, and, and it's always a headache. Um, but we need the idea of, I can't take down my entire application as I upgrade everything. So how do we do an A-B deployment where I swap out some containers, upgrade them, and then bring them back in and start serving data? So there's a lot that goes on in not just taking your basic, I have a container, I'm going to deploy it out, but how do you actually manage that? 
Similarly, application lifecycle management. I have my container, I've built it in dev. How do I promote it up through our typical flows through QA to production? We need application services. So I'm going to write my application, but chances are it's going to need database. Most do. Um, so we want these provided by our orchestration platform. We want access to them to be able to say, give me a database service running. Here's some basic data around it that I want. I'm sorry, some metadata around it. I'm going to connect it to my application and use it. And then we want a self-service portal. The whole idea of DevOps is bridging that gap. So instead of me as a developer submitting a ticket and saying, hey, in three days, can I get access to what I want? We want a self-service portal. Let me do what I need to do when I need to do it. So this is where OpenShift kind of plays in. And I promise this isn't any kind of sales pitch. But it's the additions on top of Kubernetes. It's all those extra layers that goes from, I have a basic image that I've built into a container. Now how do I make that into a live application? How do I make that into something that works and will continue to work? And I can ensure that um, it's secure as it's functioning. It's doing everything it needs to do. So that's great. Where does Artifactory fit in? This is a JFrog conference after all. Um, I have two slides before I hand it over. This is the slide I showed earlier for your basic flow from developer all the way out to where things are deployed. This is how that picture can look when we factor in JFrog and Artifactory. We can use them to host our library repositories. Anything from other Docker images to Java jars to Python eggs and so on and so forth. Um, they can also hold on to our images as we've built them. Um, again, it has a Docker plugin where it can take care of managing those images and making them available as we deploy. So with that, I'll transition things over. Cool. Uh, uh, you just have to wait for a few minutes. Um, so let's, uh, I would like to explain the journey of uh, microservices uh, in OpenShift and why we need Artifactory. So we have these containerized applications uh, running on OpenShift. These containerized applications or microservices, they are not empty, right? So we need to fill them up with binaries of multiple types. So we have developers, they are writing a lot of code, which is good, right? But they need binaries. If it works. What? Yep, it's okay, perfect. Thank you. So they need binaries, right? My automation tools, my build system, they also need binaries of multiple types whether it's NPM, Maven, Bower, Docker. So they need binaries, right? Uh, my ops team, they also need the newly built binaries, right? So where Artifactory fits in is it fills this gap. It acts as a source of truth for all types of binaries across all my silos, right? So that, that's where Artifactory fits in. So now these developers, they'll be building a couple of applications. Uh, they'll be building a timer applications, which is C++ based. Uh, they'll also be building a Node.js application. It's a welcome to Swamp Up application. And if time permits, they'll also build a Maven application, right? Uh, they'll be using a variety of tools. Uh, they'll be using OpenShift um, to run these containerized applications. They'll be using Artifactory as a source of truth for all types of binaries, right? Uh, they'll be using Jenkins, and they'll be using OpenShift's S2I, which, which is source to image. It's a very powerful framework. Uh, and Bintray, Git, uh, Docker, Without, uh, I don't need to mention that. Uh, now, this statement um, is a very powerful statement, right? It leverages OpenShift S2I, and what it does is, given my source code, how can I containerize my application without knowing anything about Docker, right? So over here, um, I specify my source code. I specify a builder image, which is given to me by my ops team, um, and then, boom, I get my final Dockerized image. The beauty of uh, this, why, where Artifactory comes into play, is that all the binaries required to build my Dockerized image is pulled from Artifactory. So I have like all, say, Maven dependencies or C++ packages, Docker image layers, Docker manifests, everything is pulled from Artifactory, which acts as like a source of truth for all types of binaries, right? So over here, I have my source code, but where is the magic happening, right? So the magic is happening at, at this uh, builder image, right? So this builder image, ops team will give it to me. I have my source code. It creates a Dockerized version of my application. So let's talk about this magic, what it does. It's a simple image, no, nothing fancy. There's a manifest. 
it's, it's uh, being referred by a tag, couple of layers from OS layer, framework layer, application layer, right? It has two magical files. The first is the assemble script, which is nothing like, a, it's just like a build script. It starts with like a copy source commands. Then there's a build statement, like for Maven, it, it will be a Maven clean install. For NPM, it's gonna be NPM install. Um, for C++, um, it's gonna be like Conan uh, install. So I'll be using Conan um, for C++. Uh, it's actually time to modularize a traditional monolith C++ build system, right? It doesn't make sense at this age to uh, compile or recompile my C++ dependencies, my C++ uh, transitive dependencies. It's actually time to Conanize it. Um, so here's my assemble script, which is like a build script. And then there's a run script, uh, which is the application runtime script. Like how do I run my application once I have my executable, right? So this is what the builder image looks like. Where S2I comes into play is it, get, it does a git clone, it runs this assemble script, and boom, I have my executable, right? But how do I dockerize it? So what S2I does is this executable is placed in my newly added Docker image layer, right? And I have my entire uh, my, uh, containerized microservice uh, up and running, right? And when I run this, when my image is converted to a container, this run script is being executed, right? And boom, I have my application up and running. So this is the entire flow of how the S2I works, how if I just give my source code, it containerize it, and it can run my application. So it nicely kind of enforces a, a pattern, uh, like given a, uh, my source code, how can I containerize it, right? And of course, like uh, my demo, all the pieces that you're seeing from Docker manifests to image layers to NPM dependencies to C++ dependencies, you name any technology type, everything is pulled from Artifactory including the final image which is pushed, uh, it is also pushed back to Artifactory, the one which is created. So the beauty of it is the same S2I files can be leveraged in a pipeline, right? So uh, in, in Jenkins uh, and the Blue Ocean. Blue Ocean is, is like a, a different like UI experience of, of Jenkins. So the same files can be leveraged in uh, uh, Jenkins. So yeah, this is a pipeline for C++. Uh, C++. Uh, no, this one is for Node.js. So let me jump on to a demo. All right. Perfect. Everything good? All right. So we're here. I'm using S2I. Uh, this is the build. I'm specifying a, a GitHub URL of a C++ project. So this C++ uh, project, it's a simple timer uh, application. Uh, it leverages Conan. So it relies on POCO library. POCO relies on, on OpenSSL, Zlib, uh, and electric fence. I don't compile like all the dependencies, transitive dependencies. It just pulls those pre-built packages from uh, Artifactory, right? And uh, over here, we, spe we are specifying the builder image. I'll go through each and every file of this builder image. Um, and then I specify the name of my final dockerized application. So I'll just name it timer app 107, right? Uh, and just to make it clean, no hard coding, I'm exposing a environment variable. This is, sorry, this is where it will pick all the pre-built C++ packages. So I hit enter. Now what it does is it initiates a git clone it downloads all of the C++ packages. Uh, so my POCO library, POCO has uh, dip transitive uh, dependencies, OpenSSL, Zlib. I'm not compiling like everything, right? Everything is being pulled from Artifactory, the pre-compiled C++ packages. And uh, so it does the Conan install, then uh, my CMake is being executed, and I have my .o file. That's my final uh, executable object file. Right, and now let me run this. Uh, run, let's run the application, Dockerized application that we just created. So it's this simple timer app. It's running the executable, right? It's all done by S2, OpenShift S2I, and uh, Artifactory as a source of truth. Um, and in a few minutes, we'll show how this can be leveraged in Jenkins, Blue Ocean, that's running within OpenShift. So let's see what, what those magical files are. 
So this is what a Docker file of uh, the image builder looks like. So again, it's, 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 it's nothing fancy. It's, it's, uh, the beauty of it is it enforces a policy, right? It enforces a, a standard. So over here, I'm installing um, the required packages, like I'm installing compiler, I'm installing Python, I'm installing Conan, right? Um, these two commands, I'll, I'll talk about it in a few minutes. This is where the magic happens. Uh, and basic stuff like user permissions, creating a, a placeholder for my source files, for my applications, right? And then I'm changing the user because I don't want my container to run as root. So this was the builder, the Docker file of the builder image looks like. Okay, now the magical files. So this is a build file, very easy. So it starts with the source uh, copy, right? Uh, and then uh, I'm making sure that my artifactory is source of truth. So I'm remo removing all kind of remote repositories. I'm pointing everything to local because I want artifactory to be my source of truth, right? Um, and uh, then I'm running the CMake just to compile my C++ applications. I'm bypassing upload for the demo, but it will uh, be done when I kick off Jenkins pipeline. And this is my runtime script. So whenever I'm executing, uh, doing a Docker run of my Dockerized image, this run file is being executed. All it does is it runs my, my application, right? So for uh, like NPM, it's gonna be NPM start. Uh, for, for Maven, uh, it can be like a jar. Uh, if it's executable jar, we can just do a jar file or maybe call a shell file. Okay. And similarly, the same thing can be done for Node.js as well. So this is my Node.js uh, application. I'm using a different builder image uh, because uh, uh, that part will come in my second talk, why I'm using a different builder image. Uh, and over here, it's, it's downloading the, the Docker image, all the stuff from, from Artifactory. And uh, if I run, here you go. And I have my NPM running. And just to make sure that everything is like really running, here you go. And this is my welcome to Swamp Up application. Now the same stuff we leverage in Jenkins. So, and just to make sure that hey, it's really live, uh, let me make some edit to my source code of the Node.js project. Okay, perfect. Let me do a commit. So my code is committed. Um, and by the way, this is the OpenShift origin uh, look and feel, user experience. Uh, if you see dark blue uh, circles, that means everything is good, right? My applications are running. Um, so I have a couple of applications running. I have my Artifactory running, Nginx running. Uh, I'll talk about that later. Uh, Jenkins running. Um, and uh, this is my application. Now let me run a Jenkins job. Um, so I have like, there's a C++ application running. Um, what it does is it, it boots up a containerized Jenkins slave. It has the right set of dependencies. It, it runs a project. Um, here you go. Yeah, these are like a couple of stages. Um, does a git clone, configures artifactory, pulls the dependencies, build my C++ project, pushes the artifacts back to artifactory, publishes the builds of material, uh, uh, and then runs the application eventually, right? Uh, again, like Artifactory is the source of truth for all, all types of binaries uh, in my examples. So I go back. Um, where's the pipelines? Okay, now coming back to the Node.js. So I initiated a run. I mean, I can switch back to the classic view. Yep, so it, it will pull even the Jenkins slave uh, from Artifactory. Um, and uh, Yep, it understands what Node.js is, uh, and then it will run the, the assemble file and, and the run file. Uh, now let's take a look. While this is building, uh, let's take a look at this view. Yep, here you go. So it did notice that, hey, there's a change uh, that I committed. 
Uh, so it's redeploying the application automatically. I don't have to do anything. And whenever it turns from a light blue to dark blue, I'm not sure how like easy it, it, it's in, in the projector. Um, so yeah, when, perfect, here you go. That's my upgrade. As simple as that. And if I click here, here you go. Hello everyone, welcome to Swamp Up. Right. So we demonstrated uh, different pipelines, uh, what S2I is, OpenShift S2I, uh, and it's actually pulling all the artifacts from Artifactory, which is running in OpenShift. So let's, let's go back to the deck. Now we just demoed a couple of pipelines, right? But the question is, is this enough, right? Is this robust enough? So to find out more, let me compare it to a different pipeline, right? So we talked about the pipeline where binaries are flowing. Let's talk about a pipeline where electricity is flowing, right? So we have a power generator on the left. We have a couple of transformers, a substation. We have consumers. And as a DR, they have a backup generator, right? Now, these consumers, they rely on a lot of services uh, that relies on this pipeline, like if they have to charge their electric cars, or if they have to charge their cell phones, right? Or maybe as simple as if they want to just brew a coffee, right? So on all these services, they are relying on this pipeline. This is on a good day. On a bad day, Hurricane Sandy happens. So a lot of consumers, including me, and probably including Jason as well, we are out of power, right? Um, so. Uh, and like all the services that we are relying on, they were useless, right? No matter how much complex those services were, if the pipeline is broken, those services are useless, right? So why it happened is because the pipeline was not robust, right? What, like why, why is it not robust? A couple of things. So first is the, the, the substation was low-lying substation. Uh, it got flooded, right? It was a single point of failure. It knocked off entire power. On top of it, there were poles uh, which were knocked off because of the storm. Uh, again, because there was lack of proactive health checks, right? Or there were trees next to the poles, they were not trimmed. So lack of proactive measures as well, right? And thirdly, which is the most annoying thing, flawed paper maps. It was hard to know where the power was restored, right? Or where the outage still exists, right? Um, and uh, um, so the thing is like how to make, so these are the issues, right? But now how to make it more robust by avoiding a single point of failure. Now let's talk about the robust pipelines with the artifacts. Whatever we learned from a different pipeline, let's try to ask questions, hey, whether our pipeline is robust enough. So first is if we have answers to all of these questions, that means our pipeline is robust. So how do I know if an artifactory node is down, right? Uh, the beauty of this integration is in OpenShift, it lets you know if my app is like really up, use health checks, right? Uh, even in Artifactory, it lets you know that, hey, okay, how my nodes are doing. Then what to do if a node is down, Artifactory node is down, right? Or what to do if an OpenShift node is down? Or what to do if a file system is down or corrupt, right? We don't want data loss. Uh, or what to do if my entire OpenShift cluster or my entire Artifactory cluster is down? So if we have answers to all of these questions, I think our pipeline is robust. So let's take a look at solutions. So first one is use health checks. So Artifactory exposes a rest endpoint, and in OpenShift, there, there's a perfect way to enter these kind of health checks in place. If something bad happens, it notifies you right away. So we're taking proactive measures. Other is use uh, Artifactory HA, right? So if one node goes down, or two node goes down, your other node is still serving read and write requests. The third is redundancy, right? Uh, what it means, say, if I set it to true, then my file is replicated twice. So if a file system which is connected to a node, say it's corrupt, I still have my file on another node, right? So there is no data loss. And lastly is replication and disaster recovery, right? Have another instance, uh, a different database altogether, different file system altogether, just to avoid data loss. 
So this is what Artifactory Enterprise looks like on OpenShift. So on a couple of nodes, we have in, in uh, uh, so there's one primary uh, running on specific node, then secondary nodes are running on different uh, OpenShift nodes, right? There is persistent storage. Uh, there is Nginx as load balancer. Uh, you can use a database of, of your, like whatever is supported. I can't say your choice. Uh, need to respect the support matrix. And uh, Jenkins uh, for CI, CD. That's what we show. Now let's see it in action, right? So from PowerPoint back to the reality. So this is my Nginx. Um, it's required for various reasons to balance load ac across multiple Artifactory instances and also to support Docker registries in Artifactory. I have one primary, couple of secondary nodes up and running. It's MySQL, it's my database. And the entire demo which I, I ran was, was using this Artifactory. Uh, it's the same Artifactory. Uh, I don't think I, I need to talk about Artifactory over here. Um, and uh, then I have my another cluster, uh, which is replicating all the artifacts. So if my, if my other OpenShift cluster or Artifactory cluster goes down, all of my artifacts are replicated. So I have another Artifactory cluster up and running over here. Um, and I've chosen to just uh, replicate only a certain production level artifacts, not everything. So yeah, here you go. I think that's uh, it from my side. Uh, both of us, like any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Cool. I was about to say either it's very good or very bad that there are no questions. <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk. Um, mentioned that OpenShift could help manage kind of AB upgrades, yep. right, and potentially roll back. Using the example of running Artifactory on OpenShift, is there, in the sense Artifactory requires persistent storage, how does, does OpenShift help roll back in snapshot maybe data so you can go back to the previous state prior to upgrade? Uh, that's, that's a good uh, question. Um, and that's where, from data perspective, the backward compatibility, it's a quite complicated question. Uh, actually, it's a simple question, but quite complicated answer. So uh, I think the rollback of, of data is, is, uh, needs to be handled on the application side. Um, so ideally, when we roll out multiple variations of the software, the software should be backward compatible, right? If there's like a big schema change coming in, then we need to do additional stuff in case bad stuff happens. Uh, so that has to be managed on the application side uh, specifically. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah, I was just curious if it was possible or not. Or because I know different storage solutions, they might have you know snapshots, you know that can maybe if OpenShift could understand um, or coordinate that at the same time, right? So maybe or spin up another you know, cluster um, with that previous data just to test to see if the rollback was successful or not. Yeah, I mean, if the, the schema is, is uh, same, then there are no issues. But if schema is different, then we need to take care of it uh, uh, separately. Like, it's not simple as like, hey, okay, I'm just updating my Docker image to like, say, from 5 to 1 to say 5 to 2 and everything's working like a charm. So something needs to be done on the application side to, 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 to make sure that the rollout is smooth. Right. Maybe we could have like a health check or something yes. to check on that. Yes, yes. So in the health check, so it, uh, OpenShift provides, so there are two entry points. So you can have a readiness check and then you can have a liveness check, right? I think that's where the readiness check comes into picture. So you just may need to make sure that, hey, okay, my upgrade is like really successful, right? It's, it's like, it's not, ping is not the right thing, but it's really functionally up, right? That, that's, yep, so at least on the OpenShift side, it provides you two ways to enter those kind of entry points. So uh, I noticed you didn't mention mission control at all when it comes to managing your multiple artifactories when you're using OpenShift. Where is there a competition and where is there integration? There room for mission control as well as you know, OpenShift here. So I think mission control uh, uh, 
It has unique uh, features as well, uh, but it's still in, in our backlog. <laughs> so mission control, it includes a lot of uh, functional features, um, like more on the application side, which will be missing on, on so OpenShift is more on the PaaS side, right? Mission control is, is more of a SaaS offering. So not SaaS, but it's, it's software, right, on the application side. So it, it has functional, uh, like it will manage replication across multiple clusters of Artifactory. Um, so that's still, you need mission control, right? Uh, to manage licenses across multiple Artifactory instances. So those features, they won't be there in, in OpenShift because those are on the application side, not on the platform side. So for that reason, you'll still need mission control to manage that stuff. Okay. Hi, that's, uh, that was a very nice talk. Uh, I saw your demo and uh, uh, how are you deploying your application, let's say your demo web page, is it that through Jenkins or is it uh, done through the uh, OpenShift? Um, both, that's the beauty of it. So that's why I mentioned like we start with S2i and we leverage, I'll actually show you because we have I think two minutes, five minutes and then there's lunch. Uh, I can show you that. Here you go. Now let's take a look. So there are two entry points. So this is a, a, a native, like a build. Uh, so I'll explain you this file, and then I'll tell you how, I'm, how I'm, I am leveraging this in Jenkins. So it's a simple file. I mean, it's like a build file, right? So there'll be entry points for my source code, right? There'll be entry points uh, for, like, once you have source code, you need to provide credentials, right? And then you specify what I need to execute, right? A simple YAML file. So we start with the name of the application. Uh, then this GitHub, that's where I'm pulling the source. I associated a secret because everything is authenticated. Uh, and uh, I have a secret for NPM as well because I want to make sure that whenever I'm running my Node.js project, even the NPM dependencies are coming from Artifactory. And this Artifactory needs authentication, right? So there's OpenShift uh, secret. You need authentication, or if your files, like say in mavensettings.xml, sometimes you provide the credentials over there, right? So you can leverage the OC secrets. And uh, then we specify, uh, so there are two key pieces. So this is my builder image. Right, this is my source strategy, right? Um, and uh, this is my output image, right? So whenever I'm done with my build, it will uh, uh, create a Docker image of this name, right? And that's what I, I did like over here, like when I was running S2i, it's pretty much, uh, this is a YAML version of, of, of this, right? That, that's the easiest way to explain. Now given this build file, let me go to Jenkins. Okay, here you go. Configure. This is GitHub, I mean, same. And my pipeline, I'm specifying that, hey, run on a Node.js uh, 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 container. Uh, so it's a Jenkins slave, uh, because I, I don't want to run everything on master. So each of my applications, they, they run on their own containerized slave. So if you see, like, everything is empty, when I run this application, a containerized slave boots up. This stage build, it leverages the, the YAML file which I just showed you, right? And to deploy, this is a YAML file for deployment as well. So I'm leveraging the OpenShift's uh, assets, right? Um, and if you want to take a look at the YAML file of the deployment. Here you go. Actually, I have a different view. This is, I think, more intuitive. You specify the upgrade strategy, right? The timeouts, uh, like I can knock this off and if it, the application is not up by that time, it will be handy in your use case as well. Um, so it, it will, so you can play with a lot of parameters just to make sure that, hey, it's like really up and I don't have to wait forever to know whether it's up or not, right? You specify all those configurations. And over here, I'm specifying what I have to deploy. And all this I'm leveraging in, in Jenkins. 
Um, and uh, then like if you click everything you can run in a pipeline view and on Blue Ocean. Thank you. Uh -huh. OpenShift. It's your page. Oh, sir. You could just take pictures, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> well, if, if you can fill out the uh, forms on what you thought of the talk and what we can improve for the future, we would appreciate it. Uh, you can also do that in the Sketch app, uh, but please give us feedback so we can continue to improve and make this an even better conference. Thank you, guys. Thank you.